So basically, I, uh, to make this body work, which I began in 2014, um, I've been using a, a long range, extreme long range, military grade thermographic camera that can, that can image human body heat from 30.3 kilometers away, day or night. That's 18 miles. So it's a very powerful tool, military tool, not designed for civilians, not designed for storytelling, not designed for aesthetic purposes. Uh, its primary purpose um, is battlefield situational awareness, um, extreme long range border enforcement, insurgent detection, tracking, and targeting as part of advanced weapon systems. So it's, it's regarded as a weapon. Um, and it's also used in search and rescue. And the camera itself falls under the International Treaty of Arms Regulation. So it's ITAR regulated uh, under export law. So it's very difficult to get across international boundaries. It's a bit like a refugee. Um, so this is how I've made them. Um, I'm making, I'm, I'm zooming in using that extraordinary telescopic, super telescopic power to zoom right into specific details, frames within the larger, um, wider angle field of view. Um, and, um, and then to, because it's so sort of telescopic, I've mounted the camera onto a robotic motion control arm, a sort of rig system that allows me to, to pan and tile on an X and Y axis, a bit like this. Um, so each of these images is made up of usually around 900 individual cells or video frames. Um, each, each cell is one megapixel because that's the native image resolution of the camera itself. And then I we tabulate these in Photoshop, um, me and my technician Steve, and we build this extraordinarily large file <laughs> in Photoshop with 900 layers and maybe another 900 adjustment layers. And then Steve blends them, which takes weeks and weeks. Um, and so uh, what happens is that there's a, it's, it's, not a, it's not really a photograph actually, because we're tabulating hundreds and hundreds of smaller images. Um, and what happens is each of those smaller images has its own vanishing point. Uh, so when you, when you cobble them together in this way, particular, particularly when the image is further away, this would be from two kilometers away, I was sitting on an adjacent hillside, so they're facing hills. Uh, and what emerges is, a, is an image with a very unusual, unfamiliar kind of perspective. Um, a little description of perspective. Um, and, and so t to our eye, an image like this doesn't seem like a normal photo. To my eye, it, it, it's a bit closer, in my opinion, um, to late medieval painting. Um, and this is just a happy accident. It's not like I went out and said, oh, I'm going to make something that approximates late medieval painting. But to my eye, it's something a bit closer to the Liber, Liber Chronicarum or the Nuremberg Chronicles. Um, images like this that describe cityscapes before linear perspective really became the sort of uh, the, uh, the index and the, the way we see uh, in, and that was in the, the Enlightenment, which is slightly later. Um, particularly, say, if you look at the hills in the back of this painting, Madonna of Humility by Giovanni Di Paolo, you can see how bizarrely, I know in my eye, <laughs> heat map-like, that, 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 those, those hills in the distance, they resemble the ways in which some of these images articulate space. And an image like this also by Di Paolo, St. John the Baptist going into the wilderness. You can see St. John lower left here, and he's making his journey, and then he appears again in the same painting, in the same frame. So this is what's known in our history as a continuous narrative. Um, and it's, I like it a lot. And we, we, don't, we can't think in that way anymore. It seems quite sort of childish now. Uh, but we find it in the heat maps too. So you can see here there's a fellow with a hooded, hooded jacket. And there he is again. Um, and this is a result of him walking through space, obviously, because he's a human and he can move. He can walk, just like animals and cars can. Well, cars can't walk, but they can move. But occasionally, when they walk through the refugee camp, um, the camera, which is moving on this X and Y axis, it captures them twice. And so that's exactly what happened here. And we've, we've, I've chosen to keep that in. Um, but another thing that's happened is the sort of spatio-temporal truncation of the figure of the refugee. Um, so here, the camera has this, this sort of come along on a, and, and it's captured his legs only. And then it's come, come back around. And so these are very durational photographs. They take about 40 minutes to capture. So when it's come back around on the next row, uh, he's moved, he's, he's playing, he's, 
This is an Afghan refugee in Adashevsky camp in Croatia. He's a nice summer, summer's evening, afternoon, and he's whiling away at the time with all his buddies playing cricket. And so by the time it's come around, which is maybe a minute or two minutes later, there he is in a slightly different position on the, on the forecourts of this gas station. Um, and so I decided to keep all these artifacts in because um, uh, I felt they express, at least to me, this, uh, this limbo state that the refugee exists within, um, a kind of a truncated existence where they cannot work, they're not free to move, and they're forced by our societies to exist within these camp environments, which are very marginalized and usually far from urban centers and uh, not much fun to live in, very, very squalid often. Um, so just to bust a move, I'm going to try and read a short text that's in the book um, to try to give you, well, hopefully not to send you to sleep, but to give you um, some idea of what's going on in this work for me, or at least part of it. There's a lot of elements and layers um, to the work in my mind, um, especially it evolved as I made it. I learned more and more about the work and about the camera, about the refugee crisis and how the two could be used to tell the story better. Um, so I'm going to start reading this. I'm sorry, it's, it's much less compelling than me uh, blabbing away, but I'll try and read it quickly. So, having climbed a hill near Boynegun refugee camp on Turkey's southern border with Syria, aided by two young Syrian refugees, and this, by the way, is the, a satellite view of Boynegun refugee camp, which is home to thousands and thousands, I think like 8,000 refugees, Aided by two young Syrian refugees, I was able to begin photographing the camp below. From here, its architecture was clearly defined. Its common spaces filled with young families, clusters of school kids, women in hijab, men working or chatting, boys on bicycles, all surrounded by razor wire fences, security gates, sentry boxes, loudspeakers, air conditioning units, power lines, satellite dishes and washing hung out to dry. The murmur of daily life reached us on the warm breeze. Looking up the hill's crest behind me, I noticed a military outpost, so it chose to set the camera up in the shade of an olive tree, whose branches would help hide my activity from view. This is the outpost. I, as I said, once the camera had powered up, I used it to peer between the leaves to observe activity within the outpost. Two men stood at the top of the sentry tower, one holding what looked like a sniper rifle with scope the other operating a thermal viewing device, not unlike the one I used to surveil them. At the base of the tower, I made out an M113 armoured personnel carrier with missile launchers trained on the border. As I began documenting the camp below, programming the robotic arm on which the camera was locked, I heard gunshots. Every few hours, my Syrian helpers explained, you'll hear shooting here, any time, day or night. They shoot anyone trying to flee the war and wade the river to cross the, from Syria to Turkey. Just two days ago, a mother and her son were shot fleeing over this part of the border under cover of darkness. The refugee pointed at the field near the camp where they fell. The little boy was killed. I looked up again at the Turkish snipers in the nearby watchtower and began to understand their ruthless task, shooting to kill anyone who crosses the border, who are almost always unarmed people fleeing the Syrian war for safety. The targeting and killing of the world's most vulnerable people, refugees, particularly when crossing international boundaries, is an outrageous criminal violation of international human rights law. Yet we turn a blind eye. Since 18th March 2016, the EU-Turkey statement has enforced a system of mass refoulement, or resettlement of refugees, from the EU back to Turkey. The same country that shoots refugees crossing its southern border receives billions of euro in compensation from the EU for receiving them. This complicated political deal has brought about a dramatic decline in the dangerous sea crossings of refugees in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean, but it has done so at the expense of international human rights law and international refugee law. The EU's current policy of outsourcing its refugee crisis to less wealthy nations, usually ones whose infrastructure is already overwhelmed, sets a precedent for expedient erosions of the human rights of the refugee. Human rights violations against refugees occur in various forms all across Europe. There are violent attacks on refugees carried out by Hungarian border enforcement officers. Immigration officials racially profile passengers on trains between Italy and France, breaking Schengen and anti-discrimination laws. 
Citizens on the Greek island of Chios have attacked a pseudo-refugee camp with Molotov cocktails on a number of occasions. In Germany alone, there have been 3,335 attacks on refugees over a two-year period from 2015 to 2017. Refugees travelling on Berlin's U-Bahn system have been stabbed and murdered by German citizens. Refugee shelters across Germany have suffered arson attacks carried out oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> carried out by citizens encouraged by the extreme right political party, AFD, Alternative for Germany. Indeed, AFD politician Frau Petri has, has publicly declared that German police should use firearms to prevent illegal border crossings. Precisely what the Turkish snipers near me on the hill continue doing to this day. After hearing gunfire on the hill, I proceeded with my task of capturing a heat map of the landscape below. An unsettled feeling grew within me related to the use of weaponized optical technologies in the targeting of refugees by snipers, not far from where I myself stood doing something similar at precisely the same moment. It was not the first time I felt troubled <coughs> by my own task. This project is imbued with it. My objective here is to locate the pressure points within representation, to press on them and allow the viewer to feel these points of tension. A central point of tension in this body of work is complicity. My own complicity as a citizen of a European nation and by extension that of a Western viewer of the work. Without knowing you, the reader of this book and the viewer of the work, it's quite probable that you, like me, are a citizen of a relatively affluent nation that has ratified the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 1951 Refugee Convention. If so, then both of us as citizens are responsible for the societies in which we live and for the governments that we elect and are accountable for the ways in which our nations fail the people who flee violence and seek safety in our prosperous homelands. As a documentary photographer, I have chosen to try to convey these narratives of human displacement and the ways in which our governments fail these people but to do so in a way that discloses our complicity, that doesn't let us off the hook, which I hope will allow us to, op to apprehend our own complicity in the suffering of these people who we have failed. The problem with conventional photojournalism, as I see it, <coughs> is that it tends to leave us feeling absolved. As Susan Sontag wrote, so far as we feel sympathy, we feel we are not accomplices to what caused the suffering. Our sympathy proclaims our innocence as well as our impotence. To that extent, it can be, for all good intentions, an impertinent, if not inappropriate, response. To set aside the sympathy we extend to others beset by war and murderous politics for a reflection on how our privileges are located on the same map as their suffering and may, in ways we pr might prefer not to imagine, be linked to their suffering, as the wealth of some may imply the destitution of others, is a task for which the painful, stirring images supply only an initial spark. The camera that I have chosen to employ and the ways that I have used it are a medium that I hope will allow you to perceive this feeling of complicity in a more adequate way than, for example, a conventional reportage photograph of an impoverished child in a refugee camp. I hope these images may elicit the same disquiet that, that grew in me when I heard gunshots from the Turkish snipers on the hill along the Syrian border and proceeded with my task. This is the same feeling that I have felt on repeated trips to document the inadequate and squalid conditions inside Moria refugee camp on the Greek island of Lesbos, a place that any European citizen will be ashamed to visit. I have felt it while making every one of the heat maps in this book. This is an attempt to make visible many aspects of the challenges that refugees endure, such as those related to bodily warmth, hypothermia, physical vulnerability, temporality, state racism, biopower, necropolitics, and the dramatic erosion of human rights and international refugee law in recent years, while pointing to the ways in which we as citizens and our elected governments have chosen to receive them and continue to fail them. An estimated 14,000 refugees became stranded in the makeshift tent city of Idomeni. Conditions were extremely poor, with human effluent seeping from overwhelmed toilet facilities. The camp was dismantled in May 2016. Tempelhof Airport. Designed and built in 1934 by Professor Ernst Zagabiel as part of Albert Speer's plan for the reconstruction of Berlin, Tempelhof Airport's iconic Nazi architecture 
is a centrally located yet symbolically loaded site to house asylum seekers. It was originally intended to represent the Nazi world capital, Germania. After the Second World War, the airport played a pivotal role in the humanitarian intervention of the Berlin Airlift in 1948. The airport apron and former terminal buildings adjacent to the refugee emergency shelter also host international cultural events such as the Formula E Championship and Art Berlin Contemporary. A circus school sits alongside the container village, some of its teachers voluntarily educating and entertaining the youth living within the emergency refugee shelter. A crazy golf and an urban garden art project are also located adjacent to the camp's perimeter. An original C-47 aircraft, Raisin Bomber, which had participated in the Berlin airlift, stands on the tarmac in the distance, a symbol of democracy and humanitarian relief. A disused Cold War era radar detection dome stands on a tower above. Nizip 1 foreground is a tent city housing about 10,000 Syrian refugees. Nizip 2 background right is a container city housing 4,500, run by AFAD, the Turkish Disaster and Emergency Management Authority, and Turkish Red Crescent. Nizip is well managed but tightly controlled, with the mobility of refugees carefully regulated. It's far from urban centres of Gaziantep and San Liurfa, making it difficult for refugees to access services, markets and culture. However, official supermarkets, laundries, food kiosks, mosques, and a hospital clinic exists within the perimeter. Piraeus Port is the first port of call for the millions of refugees who have arrived in the EU via the shores of the Aegean. After the closure of Greece's northern border, the passenger terminal facilities of Piraeus became overwhelmed by an estimated 5,000 refugees living in tents and makeshift shelters along the docks. Before the summer tourist season, Greek authorities we settled large numbers of them to better facilities in purpose-built camps such as Scaramaga. However, a residual population was still clearly evidenced by late August. People who were unwilling to leave the infrastructure of the centrally located port city for officially run camps in more remote locations. I'm trying to, for the last six months, I've been trying to get this <coughs> rather difficult project, difficult to make, but also, I suppose, difficult to. <coughs> Uh, to understand, maybe to <laughs> apprehend, um, with its with so much complexity surrounding its, the technologies at, at stake, as well as the Byzantine asylum system within which the people operate. I'll be trying to sort of coalesce this into some sort of a book <coughs> to try to help myself to understand it, and hopefully the reader. Um, and so I've come come around to try to to this quote here to try to help me. Uh, I think we ought to read only the kinds of books that wound and stab us. If the book we are reading doesn't wake us up with a blow on the head, what are we reading it for? We need the books that affect us like a disaster, that grieve us deeply, like the death of someone we loved more than ourselves, like being banished into forests far from everyone, like a suicide. A book <coughs> must be the axe for the frozen sea inside us. I just wanted to know, did you have to get permission from the Turkish government to take the photographs, or was that difficult to get? Yeah, Turkey was one of the harder places to work. Uh, yeah. They're extremely, lately, in the last few years, yeah. extremely difficult. Uh, it's, it's, no, it's, no, it's not an irony that the word Byzantine means what it does. Uh, yeah. And er Erdogan, he's, he's tightening up, he's very, very aggressive and hostile towards journalists. Um, so I worked, how did I get accreditation? I worked for almost a year trying to get accreditation and got uh, Channel 4 News, I think. Or no, the New Yorker agreed to give me a, a letter of accreditation and I had to work through a, a Turkish fixer. And it took a long time. Um, and yeah, I constantly was being stopped and, uh, and people, the gendarme would try to arrest. But I, I always had my permissions. Um, also, to, to travel with the camera, I worked with Irish export lawyers to get the correct paperwork from the Department of Foreign Affairs or, and the Department of <coughs> Justice and Trade, I forget which ones. And actually, I should send him a book. He's here in Dublin, Michael Hackman, and his wife is a photography fan. Uh, so their they're help has helped a lot. But a lot of the camps were inaccessible to, to photographers. Some of them were, but some of them weren't, which is one of the reasons why I took a, an elevated yeah. point of view. And of course, the camera's designed for that exactly that sort of a verticality, mm -hmm. which verticality is an intrinsic aspect of weaponized systems and technologies. Um, it helps to be above your target. So this is, 
sort of the engaging with the, I suppose, the, the evolution of military technologies <coughs> by taking these points of view on the camp. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, great. And the others. Can you talk a little bit about the process of making the work? Because you're very well known now internationally. Did you make the work and then release it? Or you know, were you still making the work as you were showing it? And did that make it more difficult to continue to make the work? That's a good question, because yeah, I'm very impatient. So <clears throat> I release things too quickly. Uh, and I do that because it helps me understand the work, because it, it forces me to articulate it. And I, I don't recommend it because, <laughs> you know, sometimes you don't really understand something and then if you have to speak publicly about it, it's a mistake. But for me, it's helpful. Um, and so I released this quite, quite early on. I had a show, actually, in New York, uh, February 2017. Jack Jan January, Jack Shaman Gallery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the New Yorker picked it up and they said they would feature it, preview it, you know. And the, the writer, <laughs> he, he was saying how I'm dehumanizing refugees and I'm like, oh, fuck. This is what I have to deal with now. I have to try to re-articulate. Because essentially that's true. I'm entering into that, that, that lang visual language, but I'm doing so in order to reveal the ways in which our state and our societies are, and we as citizens regard and represent the figure of the refugee. And of course, that's not easy for some people to swallow, particularly in the States. They don't like art that makes them feel uncomfortable <laughs> at the moment. Uh, you have to, they have to make a certain kind of art in the States at the moment because of cultural wars that are occurring so yeah so so that has been maybe I preempted myself but but through doing so I learn how to articulate better uh, and that leads eventually you'd have more and more shows of the work it leads to the book finally at, right at the end mm -hmm. after which maybe it's too late to release it but I'm very happy with the book and it took a long time to get the right to hit it in the right way for me um, and you've also shown it as a film in the, in the bar right so yeah. this is also a, a sister project, the same project, but it's an aspect of, ink of, a, of a, a larger project which incorporates an immersive multi-channel video installation, which first premiered in, in February, Valentine's Day, 2017. And that piece is called Incoming. Incoming. It's, uh, it was made in collaboration with Trevor <coughs> Tweeton and Ben Frost. And Tr Trevor is a cinematographer, Ben is a sound composer. Um, and it was made with the same camera. And it's, it's a it's a very different piece on some level because it's very visceral. It's, uh, it's very much more proximate. You get very intimate, very tender portraiture out of the camera. We're using it on Steadicam, so it's very dynamic. And the score is really, it's also extremely dynamic, sometimes very, quite quiet, but also very aggressive. Uh, and so it, it's, as a result, it's quite emotive, whereas this is super dry work. It's quite, con it's very conceptual. Um, and so I guess they're, two very different approaches, like a yin and a yang, to, to, the, same, to the same subject. Um, any more questions to them? Two of them here, I'll take the first hand I saw. Hi, um, actually just wondering, how do you even go about sourcing a camera like that? Because you're buying a hard to get the equipment or how do you do it? Yeah, no, I, well I didn't know about it for a start. So that was, it was amazingly lucky that I happened upon it, which is, through my friend Sophie Darlington, who shoots for BBC Planet Earth. So she's a super award-winning, world-famous wildlife cinematographer. And uh, she, she, jumped, she bumped into me in my opening in London in 2014 at the Enclave. I had a show there of previous work. And she's like, Richard, you don't know me. My name's Sophie, can we meet for tea? So I'm like, you're clearly crazy, but okay, I'll meet you for tea. So we met up the next day and uh, she's like, Richard, uh, did you happen to go to school in St. Columbus College, Dublin? And I'm like, I did, and Sophie. And she's like, yeah, sure, that's where I went to school as well. And I'm like, whoa, okay, fucking, did you like the place? And I'm like, no. She's like, no, I hated it. So, so we, got, we started to get on very well uh, already. And, and so she introduced herself and explained what she does. And I'm like, wow, yeah. So she'd just come off a film shooting for Disney, um, a film called Bears. And she said she's very disillusioned because she'd submitted all this really important material about how bears as a species were, were really having a hard time with climate change and it, like she's capturing like tangibly important footage like primary documentary footage of this submits it to Disney and they, they sugarcoat it and they, they give each of the bears like stupid voiceovers and make it like a happy ending and it's just like she couldn't feel more angry so she'd seen the enclave she's like Richard let's you don't have to 
you don't, you don't work like Disney. You, we can do a sad ending. Uh, let's work together. So I'm like, well, what will we do? And she's like, there's this camera that I really want to use. And so her superpower as a wildlife DP is super long lens. She's got a very steady hand. And she's got an understanding of the animals, where they'll jump and stuff. So she really wanted to use this camera because it can, it can see what's going on in the middle of the night in terms of predation and on the Serengeti or whatever. But BBC wouldn't let her use it. So, so I said, Asha, we'll go and look at it. And I, I was skeptical. And uh, we went up to this, this weapons manufacturing company in the UK somewhere. And there's all these men in white suits with clipboards. And it was all the, on the right, as we came in, there was the virtual war room. On the left was a massive cruise missile. Uh, presentation and I thought Jesus uh, and so we went up on the rooftop and they had it all set up for me and this, I couldn't see with my eye it was a nice summer's day um, and actually these two specks of people on a building site and we zoomed right in on them and they had their because it was a warm day they had their tops off you know and one of them had like myself a lovely big beer belly you know and uh, he was welding he had a welding gun and that flame signature of the from the welding gun was reflected in his solar plexus and I looked at Sophie, I'm like, this is nothing I've ever seen before. This is a whole new world. So I looked at the guy with the clipboard and I said, I'll take it. Uh, and he's like, I don't know if you can afford it. So I then went to my gallery on Bend Knee. Uh, and so it took about a year for them to make the camera. And it was it took at least a year. Still still trying to raise the funds to pay for it. Uh, what was it? I can't. I don't, I don't like to talk money. <laughs> it's distracting. You know? it's, it's not about that. But uh, so, so yeah, it's been a weird journey. And they wouldn't sell to normal consumers, obviously, mm -hmm. but because I had an in through Sophie, because they really wanted to work with, with planet Earth, I suppose, to assuage their guilty consciences or something. Um, so they, yeah, so we, we worked on it. But Sophie was too busy. She was off in Alaska up a tree. So I couldn't work with her in the end, but she became a good buddy.